Today's stuff we're going to be learning is Bava Metziah Daf Lamedalid. Um, I just want to say that we started last night the three sec, uh, the three three part mini series of Karen Rosenberg on the Beginner's Guide to Gemara in Hebrew. Um, already heard that's actually right now even from learners. As well, I got some feedback how great it was, and also that it's somewhat different from the introductory shear by Leah Sarna by Rabbi Leah Sarna. Each one kind of focused on different aspects. Obviously, there's some overlap. But um, if people want to join, you can join the course, you can come to the Zoom, you can also uh, just listen to the courses whenever, the Shireen whenever you want. It's free, it's on our website, like all our other courses. If you need help, you can always email us. Today's staff is sponsored by Rina Mark Goldstein, in loving memory of Rina's father, Mo Septi, Moshe Ben Harav, Elazar Shmuel, and his 27th year. So we're going to get started we, we, with a little bit of an introduction. I'm going to share my screen and show you the... Um, the study guide for today. So second, share screen. I want to, this is our main chart basically for, um, for this chapter, which is all about Shomrim. And these are basics you have to know. We've been through them here and there, but I want to kind of map it all out. So we have four types of Shomrim, Shomer Chinam, Shomer Sechar, Socher, and Shoel. Now in the Torah, there's really only three. The Shomer Chinam, the Shomer Sechar, and the Shoel. The Socher is not mentioned explicitly in the Torah. And because of that, you can see on this chart there, there's a machloka between Rabbi Meir and Rabbi Yehuda about whether we treat a socher, someone who rents. Okay, let's go through what these mean because I'm using the terms in Hebrew. They might not be clear to you. Shomer Chinam is someone who watches an object for free. Shomer Sachar is someone who watches an object and gets paid. Socher is someone who rents an object and a shoel is someone who borrows. Now a socher and a shoel are inherently different from a shomer because a shomer is not allowed to use the item, whereas a renter and a borrower, that's the whole point, they're borrowing it to use. But a socher actually has to pay, and that's why we're going to be more lenient, as opposed to a shoel, who we always say, all the benefits go to the shoel, because the shoel borrows, they don't have to pay, and they get to use the item. So that's going, and the socher, on the one hand, they pay, on the other hand, they're allowed to use the item. It's not clear whether they're more similar to a shomer chinam or to a shomer sachal, and therefore, there's a machloka between Rabbi Meir and Rabbi Yehuda. So we'll get to that machloka later. In any case, let's talk about the Shomer Chinam, and, the, and let's talk about what's true. All of them are chayav and pshia, if you notice. Everyone has to pay if you do something wrong, okay? If you are irresponsible, you're, you're supposed to watch. Even if you're renting or borrowing, you're obviously supposed to protect the person's item. So everyone is going to be liable for pshia. But then we're going to have the Shomer Chinam on one extreme and the Shol on the other extreme, okay? So when it comes to Gineva Vavedah, if it's stolen or lost, so a Shomer Chinam who was doing it for free, we're going to exempt them. But if you're getting paid to watch it, then you're already Chayav. And of course, if you're borrowing it, you're going to be liable. And then the Socher, it depends whether you view the Socher like a Shomer Chinam or like a Shomer Sechal. If it comes to Ones, unexpected damages, everyone will be exempt other than the Shoel. Because a Shoel, because all the benefits are theirs, they're actually liable for onus. However, there's one type of onus, which is what we call meta machmat malacha, that if the animal dies from work while it's working and it was supposed to be doing what it's supposed to be doing and yet it just dropped dead, that already we are not going to make the shawl responsible for. So those are things you have to do as basics for understanding our chapter. Now that we've gotten through that, we'll go back to our case. Our case is a shomer chinam who is basically exempt from theft. But you might remember, what does it mean to be exempt from theft? It means, or or let's say a Shomer Sachar, when it comes to being exempt for onus, it means that you have to come to the court and take an oath that it was stolen or lost. Or if you're a Shomer Sachar, you have to take an oath that it was onus, what happened. Okay, and it was beyond your circumstances and not that it was just stolen, because stolen you'd have to pay for if you were a Shomer Sachar, or right, accordingly. Let's say you don't want to take an oath for whatever reason and you don't like oaths, or you just feel responsible anyway. So you want to pay, even though, right, it's not, you're not supposed to be held responsible, but you voluntarily say, I'm going to pay. So what we learned yesterday is you acquire the rights to the kefil, meaning if I am a Shomer Chinam, I'm watching your item for free, and I come and say, listen, I know I can be exempt if I take an oath. I don't want to do that. I'm going to pay you for it. When I pay you for it, I acquire the rights to the kefil payment. So if we find the thief, and the thief pays back the money, then I gain, okay? Now, I can now get the double payment or our Ba'ab Hamisha, you know, if that were the case. So now we had a question. Rami Barhama says, now the assumption is, how does this work? 
The way it works is that you basically give me rights to the kefel, and, and even we're going to see from the beginning, okay? Because what it really means is that when we went into this deal together and you asked me to watch your item, what you're basically saying from the beginning is, if in the event of theft and you decide to pay for it and we find the thief, you'll get the kefel. It's as if you're giving me rights to that because otherwise it's your item and you're right. So how else could I get it if you don't do that? Now, if back in January, let's say you gave me the item to, to watch in February, it was stolen. And then I say, I'm going to pay or I pay. And then we'll get to that whole thing in a minute, in a few minutes, whether even just saying I could pay would be enough. And then we find the thief in March, I get the payment. And it's all based on what we agreed upon in January. Now, even though you didn't explicitly say this, we assume it's implicit in the agreement that you're giving me rights to the careful in the event that I paid for. To which Rami Brahama says, how could you possibly do this? That means that in January, you gave me rights to something that didn't yet exist, right? We said, Ain Adam This is the bottom of yesterday's staff that we already read. And even Rabbi Meir, who holds that you can give rights to something that's not in existence yet, that's only perotekel, davide datu. That's like you can give me, we can talk about giving me rights to fruit that will grow on this tree. Because fruits will grow on the tree, right? Likely anyway. But avalhacha, in our case, number one, mi emer de mignava, who's to say, right, when we're standing there in January and you're giving me your item to watch, who who says it's going to be stolen? Vintim tzalomer de mignava, and even if it is stolen, right? Imagine your flow chart, stolen or not stolen. Within stolen, well, how do we know we're going to even find the ganav? And even, even if we find the ganav, so, okay, we have stolen or not stolen, find the ganav or not find the ganav within stolen. And then we have me. Who's to say I'm going to pay for it? Maybe I'll probably use my ticket out, my get out of jail free card. You know, I can basically say, oh, I'll just take an oath and be exempt. So there's, Three things that have to happen that are you know, unlikely, each one, right? Each one is more unlikely than the next that would have to happen for this to take place. So it's really, so how can we possibly be standing in January doing a deal and you're thinking about this? doesn't make any sense. So I'm a Rafa, and, and even if you are thinking about those things, you don't have the rights to give me that, okay? Because it's not in existence yet. So I'm a rabbi. Nasek ki omer lo. It's like you're saying to me, okay, and this is basically, again, this means there was an ex implicit, not explicit, it wasn't said, but it was as if it was said, when you give me anyone who gives someone an item to watch, basically what they're saying is the following. We're going to have two versions of rabbi. This is version one. Okay, today we have two versions of two different things. This is the first one. Lechishetigane v'tirtse utishalemi and this language will resolve this because it's as if you're saying in the event that it's stolen and you decide to pay uh, uh, and sorry, and we find the ganav and you decide to pay or it doesn't really say we find the ganav, but if it's stolen and you decide to pay me, it's as if my para is retroactively from this moment given to you. In other words, what have we done here? We've switched it to it's not a davar shalom ba'la olam because you're basically giving me your cow. You're saying the para is in this world. So you're, whatever the item is, the para is just an example. But it's as if you're saying, when you give me the item to watch, I'm giving this cow to you from now if the following things happen. So the if the following things happen are just conditions to the, to the, to the transfer of ownership. It's not a davar shalom ba'la olam. You can always put in stipulations. What we've switched is the subject is not you're acquiring rights to some kefil, which doesn't even necessarily exist. It's that you're acquiring rights to the cow. Okay? And that the, it's going to be retroactive from right now. Okay. To which Rabbi Zera says, I have a big problem with what you're saying. Matafla Rabbi Zera. Ihachi, if you're actually giving me rights to acquire the cow retroactively from now, in the event that all this does happen and the condition is filled, it turns out that when in March we find the ganav and I get the kefel, I actually acquire the animal already from January. Well, if I acquire the animal from January, then afilu gizotel vladotel anami. Then if retroactively at that point I acquire the animal from January, 
any shearings, okay, not assuming it was a cow, but if it was a sheep, any shearings or offspring, if it was a female animal, would be mine because basically I'm retroactively acquiring the animal from January. And if you want to say that, yeah, you're right, it should be, well, Alama Tanya, then why does it say in the following Brita, who is me Gizotel Vladota? You don't get the Giza and the, and the Vladot. You don't get the offspring. You don't get the shearing, which means you're not really, and it's rather, how can you say I acquired the animal from January? If I require it retroactively from January, everything should be mine. So Ella Amar Rabbi Zera, Rabbi Zera has to fix Rava a little bit and say, Basically, when you give me rights to the, what you're basically doing is saying, you lend me the animal or you, you know, let's say give it to me to watch. And you basically are saying to me, in the event that it's stolen or all that, my para will be acquired by you right now for its value, for the kefel, the double payment, but not anything that comes off of it, the payro, the, not the, the, the giza, not the vlado, that's not. So now they say, well, my pasca, why would that be the case? In other words, you haven't said anything. We're just all assuming that this is what you meant. So now they say, and, and if that's what you meant, why would you distinguish between the kefel and between the giza, the giza and the vlado, okay? What's the difference between them that we assume that when you give me an item to watch, you're willing and, and interested in giving me rights to the kefel payment if I decide to pay for it, but you're not willing to give me the rights to the giza and vlado, to which they say, stama de milta, it, it, it's the way a person would normally behave because shvacha de atame alma avid inish to machne. You're willing to give me something that any any um, enhancement or extra like kefel, which might come from the outside. In other words, there's a, how much of a chance is there that this item will get stolen, that I'll decide to pay, and that they'll, the kid, they'll be the, the ganav will then pay, and we'll find the thief. It's a very small chance. That small chance you're willing to, to give to me because oh, maybe there'll be some extra amount you know, that will come, maybe I'll get a careful payment for the value of my animal. You're willing to give it to me because it's unlikely it's even going to happen. But, 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 shevach that comes from the body of the animal, which is, it's kind of like the Perot Dekel, right? That it's pretty clear going to happen. You're not willing to give up rights to that. I'm just watching your animal. This isn't a sale. This isn't anything like that. So basically that's the assumption. Okay, so again, let's just try to imagine what's going on here. You want me to watch your item. So you're willing to give up something for it. You're basically saying to me, if you decide to take responsibility and pay for it in a case where you really don't have to pay, you say to me, then I'll give you rights to the animal from the beginning. But what kind of rights am I giving you? Just rights to the kettle. I'm not giving you rights to the gizan of Lado, you say to me, because that would be crazy, right? That a typical person wouldn't do that. So we had Rava, who basically said, because I want to go over this because we're going to have a different version of Rava. Rabbi basically said, how does this work? How do we get it out of because we switched the subject to the cow, which is in existence right now. And then the other stuff, which is not in existence, are just stipulations. If this and this happens, then the cow will be acquired. To you by now. Came Rabbi Zeri and he said, what about the Gizan of Lado? Ah, don't worry about that. Obviously, you didn't mean to do that because nobody would really do that. Now, Ikid Amri, second version. Amarava, and in this version, we're going to basically preclude the need to have Rabbi Zeri's question. You'll see why. Rabbi Zeri's question won't be relevant about the Gizan of Lado. So, so far, it's the same thing. Right? It's as if you said to me, in the event that it's stolen and you decide to pay me, it's going to be acquired by me a minute before the theft. In other words, right, this sounds like all those get cases, right? It'll be yours retroactively, or right? We had all these things. So, you know, right? An hour before my death. It's the same language as we're using here. It'll be that it'll be acquired to a moment before the theft happens. Now, my benayu, what's the what's the nafkamina between them? Two nafkaminas. Ika benayu kushe to Rabbi Zera. Well, Rabbi Zera's question won't be relevant because if it was stolen in February and you gave it to me in January, any gizar of Lado from January to February won't be mine anyway, because I'm only acquiring it the moment before it 
is stolen, which means there is no gizat and blood doth. The animal's not giving birth that very second or being sheared that very second. It's getting stolen that very second. So the assumption is that, that, that that's just not a question according to this version. That basically resolves Rabbi Zera's question. Inami, another nafkamina, and this we didn't really discuss yet, and we'll get to this right now, dekaima ba'agam. How do I acquire something a minute before theft? Okay, let's go back to the first case. How can we say that I acquired it, Me'akshah? Because in January, when you gave me the animal, I did an act of acquiring. I pulled the animal toward me, right? I took it to watch, which also retroactively will count as my moment of acquiring it. Now, if you say an hour before it's stolen, how do I acquire it then? I didn't pull it at that moment. I didn't do any act of acquiring, but I did because it was in my courtyard. Remember, chatzer of an adam is konet. The assumption is I'm watching it. It's in my house. So therefore, I can acquire it a minute before it was stolen by it being in my property. But if it happened to be out in the marsh and, you know, it was walking and it was out and it wasn't in my property, then I can't acquire it. Then this wouldn't work, the second version of Rava. The one that says my achshav from the beginning, it would work because it was an act of acquiring. But the second one wouldn't work if at the moment before theft, it was outside. So that would be a problem. Now we're going to move on to the next section, which is a, I referenced before, but now we'll see it inside. The Mishnah says, she The Mishnah said, I'm a Shomer Chinam, I'm watching it for free. I basically decide I'm going to take an, um, instead of taking the oath, I'm going to pay. So when I pay, I acquire rights. Which makes sense. I paid money. I now have rights to it. Comes Rabbi Yochanan with a big chiddush. And this is going to be something we're going to deal with a lot today. I'm Rabbi Chir Bar Abba Ma Rabbi Yochanan. Lo shilem, shilem amash. We've actually learned this before. Ela kevan she'amar harini meshalem. Afopi shelo shilem. Comes Rabbi Yochanan, he says, you don't, I think we've learned this before. Maybe I'm confused, but I think, it actually says it's further on Alam and Zion. So maybe we haven't learned it yet. Anyway, Rabbi Chir Bar Abba says, in the name of Rabbi Yochanan, you don't have to actually pay in order to gain the kefel, me, okay, I'm the shomer. Even if I just say, I'm not going to take the oath, I'm going to pay. I didn't get paid because I just didn't get to it. And then we find the thief, I get the kefel because I was willing to pay. My stating, which is a fascinating chidush, just by saying I'm willing to pay, already gains me the rights to the kefel. So which the Gemara says, what are you talking about? Tanan, look at the words in the Mishnah. Shilem below what's other shava. Shilem in lo shilem lo. Sounds like if you pay, it says it. If you pay, you get the rights to the kefal, which seems to imply if you didn't pay, you don't get the rights to the kefal. So they say, no, you don't have to infer that because look at the end of the Mishnah, the other case in the Mishnah, Ema Seifa. Nishba, look at the language. You take an oath. I'm sure you didn't pay attention to this language. Below ratzal shalem. You didn't want to pay. It doesn't say nishba below shilem. It says, Nishba velo ratzalashalim. You took an oath because you didn't want to pay. Tama de lo ratza. The reason sounds like because you didn't want to pay. Ha ratza sounds like, but if you did want to pay, afa pishalo shalim. Even if you didn't pay. Sounds like the opposite of Nishba velo ratzalashalim is lo nishba ki ratzalashalim. Right? You didn't take an oath because you wanted to pay. Sounds like it's enough to just say. So now, they say, So you can't you can't question me from the language of the Mishnah and the Reisha because I can prove my point from the language of the Seifa. So the Mishnah is inconclusive. But basically, Rabbi Yochanan says, this is how I read the Mishnah. Okay, in other words, you could try to prove to me the opposite, but I could support my reading from the Seifa. And that's what he says. Just by saying I want to pay, that's enough. Um, Tanya Kavatei to Rabbi Yochanan, and here's a Brayta. Like Rabbi Yochanan, we're going to come back to this Brayta, so just remember, right here is a Brayta. Later, they're going to reference a Brayta, and this is going to be it. Hasocher para mechavero, you rent a para from your friend, v'nignivan, it's stolen. V'amal hala hareni mishalem, ve'eni nishba, and the person says, the Socher says, I'm going to pay, I'm not going to take an oath. Achar kach nimtza aganav, and then the ganav is found, mishalem tashlume kefer la Socher. So the renter gets it. So what do you see here? Just by saying, I want to pay, that's enough to get you the kefal. That supports Rabbi Yochan. Now we're going to move on to Rabbi Papa, who's going to basically say the same thing as Rabbi Yochanan. However, we're going to have two readings of Rabbi Papa. This I charted out on the page. And the first reading is going to have one case where it actually doesn't work to say, if you say you're going to pay, it's not going to work in one case. Okay? But all the other cases, it does work like Rabbi Yochanan. 
So Amar Rav Papa. Now he's going to go through, and this is why the chart was important: the Shomer Safar, the Shomer Chinam, or I should say the Shomer Chinam, then the Shomer Sachar, and the Shoah. So Shomer Chinam, we're going to basically give examples of each one because each one is going to be different. He says the following: Kevan Amal Pashati he says you don't even have to say Hareni Mishalein. You just have to say a claim. Now, we don't know what happened. We have no idea. What happens in your house, we don't know. So I'm the Shomer Chinam. We don't know what happened in my house. The animal was stolen, but I claim it was my fault. Okay, I say I left the door open all day long and, you know, let people into my house and it was stolen while I let everybody into my house. You know, that's, that's negligent. That's my fault. If I'm a Shomer Chinam, I'd have to take responsibility and pay. So it's, what he's basically saying is that's like saying Hareini Mishalein because I could have, said it was stolen, period. Nobody would know that it was my fault. So the fact that I volunteer that information is like saying, and if I say Pashati, I'm gonna have to pay. It's like saying Arini Mishale, and therefore Makna Lake Fela. I get rights to the kefel if the thief is found. Divani, because if I wanted to, Patronafshi Bigneva, I could have just said it was stolen and be exempt. Now Shomer Safar can't say it was stolen and be exempt. They'd have to pay. So in this case we're gonna have to have a different one. Shomer Sakhar, but it's a parallel. Hevancha Amar Nigneva. The Shomer Sakhar says it was stolen. Now that's a case where the Shomer Sakhar has to pay. So the Shomer Sakhar who says it was stolen, which is not like the thief who had, uh, like the Shomer Chinam who had to say, I was negligent. Here, all he has to say is it was stolen. Maknelik Felim. Again, the Shomer Sakhar will get the rights of the Kefal just by saying that. Why? Dibai, Patronashe, Bishfuru Meta, because he could have said it broke. It died unexpectedly, onus, and could have exempted himself in that way. Shoel, Shomer, here comes his big thing, though. If a Shoel says, Haleni Mishalein, I'm going to pay, okay, for whatever reason, okay, but in other words, Shoel has to pay in any case, right, except for Meta Machmat Malacha. If I was using it in its typical way, I borrowed it to use the animal to plow, let's say, and while the animal was plowing, it dropped dead, I'm not liable. So if I say I'm going to pay, I can never gain rights to the kefa. Why? Well, let's try to do the same thing, fill in like the other ones. I could have said, right? If I really wanted. So maybe I should get the kefa. Well, how could I have exempted myself if I'm borrowing it? So I could have theoretically, in which case I should get the kefa, just like the other cases. But but they say it's such a rare case. Words, to say it was stolen, to say I was negligent, that you know, and and basically it could have been. What what could I have exempted myself in the Shomer Chinam? It could it could have been stolen. I could have been exempt for the for the Shomer Sachar. It could have been onus. That that is typical. But to say that's very atypical. That a shore in the middle of plowing just drops dead. So because it's such an uncommon case, we can't say I could have said that because. It was so rare, we don't accept that kind of a claim. That's the first reading of Rav Papa. Now, Rav Papa doesn't say this explicitly, but this, Rav Papa is all talking about if I just said, like Rabbi Yochanan. And basically what he's saying is he's taking Rabbi Yochanan and saying, if I said I'm going to pay, which could be also, I pashati, I was I stole if he was a Shomer Sachar. That's like saying Harani Mishalem, and that all works, but not for a Shoah. And okay, we're going to have one exception. A Shoah can't exempt himself by saying Harani Mishalem because his alternatives are so unique and unlikely that it's not we're not going to allow it. But what if, according to Rapapa, we don't know really, what would Rapapa say if they actually paid? Okay, If they paid, would he allow the Shoah to be exempt if the Shoah paid? Right? Is, is there some, or, or the Shomer Chinam? In other words, this is all Hareini Omer. What if they actually, what if the Shoah actually paid? So it's not clear. Okay, we're going to assume that if he actually paid, then it would work. Okay, and it's just because the Shoal only said by saying alone, it's not going to work, but we don't fully know. And actually, if you look at the last Tosfat on the page here, Lilish Nakama, Tosfat suggests that Rabbeinu Hanano actually has a different gear so later on in the Gemara. And based on that, or or based on the way he understands this, he thinks her papa would think it doesn't work at all ever. And the Shoal can't get the Kefel ever. Okay, even if they actually paid. Okay, but We'll leave that point aside. It's just a, a small point I wanted to mention. Now, Ika de Amri, second version of Rav Papa. Amar Rav Papa, Shoal Nami. Shoal's just like everyone else. Kevan Shamar Harani Mishalei Machin Lake Fela. The Shoal says, I'm going to pay. Gets the Kefel because the Shoal could have said, Meitamachma Malacha didn't. Again, this is because of no evidence. It's just his word. 
we basically give them rights. And, and we don't say, oh, it's so rare. Okay? Since the Shoal could have said that, gets the rights. I'm only Rav Zvi. Rav Zvi comes in questions Rav Papa according to the second version and says, So Rav Zvi says, that Abai says the Shoal only gets rights if the Shoal actually pays. Okay? So that that's not, okay, he basically says, I don't agree with you. My time, huh? why is that? Why does the Shoal have to pay? And this, like, that's why I mentioned Rav Papa. The first Rav Papa, most people, or Rashi at least, thinks that Rav Papa agrees with the statement of Rav Zvi, that if the Shoal pays, yes, okay? My time, huh? In other words, by saying I'm going to pay, that's not enough. Only by actually paying. Okay, we're going to distinguish, and that goes with, right, what we said before, that Dibor is not enough to work for a Shoah. It does, but paying would. And in fact, there's a bright to support Rav Zvid. So if you borrow a para from your friend and it's stolen, notice it's not about a Shoah. And it says, and the Shoah paid. Now, if the Shoah paid, and then we find if the shawl actually pays for the item and then the thief is found, right? Of course, the shawl is going to get the money because he paid. That's what the Brita says. So that matches Rosvid. It doesn't match Rapapa here in the second version because the second version of Rapapa said, even by saying it's enough, but this says, he didn't the He had to, if he paid then. So Lalishna comment to Rapapa Vadai Lohavi Tiyufta, according to the first language of Rapapa, which again, according to Rashi, who says that. We assume that in the first version of Rav Papa, he says the Shomer, um, the Shoel doesn't gain rights to the Kefel if he said I'm going to pay, but he does gain rights if he actually paid, then this is not a question at all. This fits perfectly. Okay, if you say the opposite, you have to take out the word low here. That's what basically Tosfot says. That the one who says the opposite, the Rav Papa doesn't think, doesn't think the Shoel gets ever get the Kefel, according to the first version, you would have to get rid of the word low. This is definitely a problem because this says it explicitly if the Shoal gets the kefal. But again, I don't want to confuse you too much. But Lalishna Batra, Lema Tavi Tiyufta, but this sounds like it contradicts the second language of a Papa because the second language of a Papa was a Shoal can say, Harani Mishalem and already get the kefal. And this source says, Kidem Vishilem. You'd have to pay in order to get the kefal. So, Amar Lecha Rav Papa, no, we can answer according to Rav Papa. Remember when we brought Rabbi Yochanan, we said, the Mishnah says, if you pay, the Mishnah didn't say, if you say, I'm going to pay. But we basically said, oh, read the Mishnah as when it says, I paid. It means paid or said I paid. So when it says, Kidem Vishilem in this Brayta, you, you initiated and paid. Could be also, Kidem Ve'amar, it could be the same thing. So Hakanami Ba'amar, same thing here. So they say, midami. No, that's very different. In the Mishnah, they think this word kidem is what messes everything up. Kidem sounds like you, you initiated and actually did something, not just said something. We all know there's a difference between saying you're going to do something and actually doing something. So kidem sounds like you, you, you preempted it and you actually paid. So they say, what are you talking about? Don't infer that. My kidem, kidem ba'amal. No, you initiated and said you're going to pay. Okay, now we go back to this bright I told you to remember. We we had this bright according to Rabbi Yochanan. There it says, And there it doesn't say, It just says, And in this bright it says, So we're assuming if there it says, And here it says, There are obviously two different things. One is really Amar, and one is Kidem Vishilem. Okay, that's assuming that these bright were said together, and that's going to be the whole question. here. So they say, the fact that it says by a socher, ve'amal, and by the shoel, it said kidem, that seems to imply there's a difference between a socher and a shoel, which is exactly what we're trying to say, right? And that's the difficulty. So they say, what do you mean? Shma, all right, so shma'amina dafka katami. It sounds like kidem really means kidem v'shoel, v'shilein literally, you really actually pay. In which case, problem with Rapapa, who said it's enough to just say. So now they say, tanya. wait a minute, we have two bright toad. Okay, bright toad are... Outside sources, one's this brighter, one's that brighter, one was about a socher, one was about a show. Why are you putting them together? They're two totally different brightas. 
Why are you assuming that the language of this one will match the language of that one? This could be said in that Beit Midrash. This could have been said in that Beit Midrash. They could have used different language. You're you're learning, deriving things from a language of a difference in language between two different things, which were could be written in totally different times, different places. Who's to compare? Which they answer. Shailina Lutanai Debe Rabbi Chiyu Debe Rabbi Yoshaya. We we asked the people who bring the bright in the house and the Beit Midrash of Rabbi Chiyu, the Beit Midrash of Rabbi Yoshaya, and they told us Amri Kabei Adad Yitanya. Those two brighto were actually part of a whole brighto. And there is reason then to infer, and therefore we're left as a, this brighto actually raises a difficulty on rough pop. Now we're going to move on to another topic. It's again within the same topic, but a variation. Pshita, amal eni mishalem, bakazar amal hareni mishalem. It's obvious in a case where I first said, I'm not going to pay. And then I changed my mind, right? That means basically I'm going to take an oath that it was stolen. And then I change my mind and I say, you know what? I'm going to pay. So obviously in that case, and then we find the thief. I said, I'm going to pay. I get the rights to the kid. Obviously we're assuming we're talking about according to Rabbi Yochanan and Rav Papa who think that saying is enough. And it's not a case of a show maybe, which would be a question, but okay. But Ella Amar, Harani Mishalem. But here comes the question, turning out I'm a bit. If I started with, I'm going to pay. And then I changed my mind, the Chazar Amar, and I changed my claim. And I say, you know what? I'm not going to pay. Any Mishalem. I'm going to take an oath. My. Do what? Do, now, well, here comes the question. You're thinking, what? Obviously, you changed your mind. Well, and then let's say, so first I said, I'm going to pay. Then I said, I'm not going to pay. Then we find the thief before anything happens. I didn't take my oath yet. Do I get the capital or not? No. Why would we think I would? I said, I'm not going to pay. Well, me, I'm Rina, I'm a Hadraka Hadrabe. So do we say, I changed my mind, and therefore my claim now, I re-erase my first claim, just like we did in the, in the previous case. My first claim is off. Now I just said, I'm not going to pay. Of course, I won't get the kefa. Oh, Dilma, but Maybe when I said, I'm not going to pay, I still think I'm going to pay. But what? Why did I say I'm not going to pay? We've seen this before, like when we talked about Moda and Mikta and the whole logic behind it. I just said it because I'm trying to push you off. I don't have the money in hand right now. So I just said, oh, I'm not going to pay, which really just meant, I'm not going to pay today. When I get the money, I will. Of course, that's not what I said. But maybe that's what I meant. And maybe I really didn't undo my first claim. So if now we find the Ganav, maybe I actually do get the Kefel because I did originally say I'm going to pay. We're not going to have an answer to this question, by the way. And now we're going to have a slew of questions that we're not going to have answers to. And these are your classic Rabbi Yirmiya type questions, but they're not said in the name of Rabbi Yirmiya here. Amar Harani Mishalem Vimit. I say I'm going to pay and then I drop dead. And now my sons come, my heirs come and say, we're not going to pay. Ma. So what do we say now? Do we say they're rejecting my first claim and they're basically saying we're doing a different claim? Or or maybe they're also, in other words, if it's the same person, we have reason to think maybe I'm still in my original claim and just pushing you off. But if it's different people now, is it more likely that they're actually bringing a new claim and they're saying, we're not going to pay for this? Or maybe they're just continuing in the father, right? As if they're the father's voice and saying, oh, we're not going to pay really means, well, we keep our father's claim. We really are going to pay, but we're just not going to pay right now because we don't have the money. Or, shilmu, um, shilmu mai. what if the sons actually paid? Okay, now the sons paid, well, they should get the cat though. Mm, not sure. So, me, I'm right. I didn't skip anything, right? Yeah. Okay. Me, uh, do we say, Matze Amarlehu, the original owner, you gave me an item to watch, and now my kids, I died. My kids now paid for it. Maybe when you gave me rights to the Kepel, maybe you gave it to me, but not to them. Why would that be? You could say, I was willing to give the Kepel payment to your father because he did something good for me. He watched my item. But Lidit Hulo, but you didn't do anything for me. Why would I give it to you? Oh, Dilma Loshna, because remember, the whole power of the of the of the Shomer is that the person who gave the Shomer the item passed over rights, but maybe they passed over rights only to that person because that person was doing them. That's how we said in the beginning. They want you, right? They want to get you to do it, and, and you're doing something nice for them by watching their item. So they're willing to give you something. But the heirs, what did they have to anything to do with this? Shilem lebanim mai. Now we're going to flip it. I'm still alive, but you who gave me the item is dead now. And now I pay your children. Now, do we say, Now we flip. 
your heirs can claim, listen, our father was willing to give you kefal because you did something nice for him, but you didn't do anything for us. We don't have a relationship with you. We're not giving you kefal. We have no relationship to you. What do, why would we give you the kefal payment? Or can they not? In other words, the whole thing, are the heirs like a new, unique identity, like a, a, an independent entity? Or are they just continuing the father? It's as if they're filling in for the father and then it could be all the same. Shilmu banim lebanim mai. Okay, now we're going to switch. Every time we switch something, now we're going to have my heirs and your heirs. Already that's even more removed, right? Because they weren't there in the beginning and they weren't there at the beginning either. Okay. Shile mechzamai. Now we're in a different slew of questions. What if I only paid half of the amount? Do I get kefel on half the amount of the of the item? Sha'al shtei parot v'shilei makamehim. I borrowed two cows and I paid for one of them. So do I, now here, it's not that I paid half, it's, it's I paid half the claim, but I did pay for a whole entity, right? In the, in the previous question, I paid for only half an item. So maybe I don't get kefel on half an item, but maybe here I would get kefel on an entire item, even though it's not the complete claim. Sha'al min shutafim. I borrowed from two partners. V'shilem lechamehim. And I only paid one of them. So again, I paid half, but I paid complete what I owe to one person. So maybe they're part of the kefal I should get, or maybe not. Maybe to get kefal, I have to get the whole thing. Shutafim shashalu. Now we're switching. There were two people who borrowed. So me, the borrower, I'm now, let's say, I'm assuming I'm with you. And shilem lechamehim. And one of us paid for the kefal. Do we get our share of the kefal payment? This has to do with if you remember. Items that a woman inherits, the value of them, is the, the principal is hers, but the husband gets payroll. So now if they borrowed from the woman, but paid the husband. So the husband doesn't have the rights to give the kefil of the value of the principal. On the other hand, maybe you say the husband is operating as an apitropus of the woman because he has rights to use her property. So maybe that... And the reverse, where the woman borrowed and the husband paid, again, are they considered like one and the same? One is representing the other or no? Teku. And with that, we end all those questions with, we don't know the answer. Amar Rafuna, last issue for today. Rafuna says, but all these cases, when I get the kefal payment, okay, so now again, imagine the scenario. You give me an item to watch. We now have to look at it from a bit of a different perspective. Until now, what happened? We assume the item was stolen. And I basically say, you know what? I could exempt myself, but I'm going to pay anyway. And, you know, I gain rights to the kefal if and when we find the ganav. That's assuming there is a thief. But now, how do we know there's a thief? Because I said there was a thief. Maybe I just like your item and I want to keep it. So I just say, oh, you know what? I'll pay for it because I'm not a terrible person. I'm just a bad person, right? I, I want the item because I like it, but I know you're not going to sell it to me. So what will well, I do? I'll claim it's stolen. I'll pay the value. Kind of like Hamas, where, you know, the, the word Hamas in the Torah, where it means basically I steal an item, but I pay for it, right? I, I, I You don't want to sell it. I force you to. So it's like that here, but it's in my property already. And I just say, well, no one will ever notice. I'll just keep it. I'll hide it. No one will ever see it. And I'll just pay you the value. So, you know, I'll feel better about it. So there's a concern in this case. When a Shomer Finam says, well, it was stolen and I'm going to pay for it. Maybe it's still in their property. So Rav Huna adds that, by the way, they don't. So by Torah law, I have to take an oath to say it was stolen if I want to exempt myself. That's a Torah law shvul. Maybe I don't want to do that, and that's why I'm willing to pay. Or maybe I want to pay because I want to gain the possible rights to the kef. But Funa says, when I come forward and say I want to pay when I don't really have to pay, we're a little bit suspicious of me. And therefore, must be shuto. we force me to take an oath that it's no longer in my property. I have to say that, Okay. Because if I don't say that, if you remember, by the way, the shvur that Shomofina generally needs to take is, I, I swear that it was stolen. I swear that it's not in my possession anymore. Okay, well, we're always worried about this. So basically, we make him take an oath that it's not in his possession. My time. Maybe he liked the item and wanted to keep it. Now we're going to bring a difficulty on this. It's a very long brighta. We're not going to get to the difficulty today. We're just going to learn the cases of the Brighta. So we'll forget about Rav Huna for now. Tomorrow in the beginning of class, we'll come back to Rav Huna and explain how this Brighta contradicts. Right now, I want you to understand the cases in this Brighta. We're going to have a case of a loan. I loaned you money and you gave me collateral. And then I lose the collateral. Now, the problem is, right? Let's say you give me my your watch. I loaned you $100 and your watch well, the problem is it's lost now. So we don't really know what it was worth. 
and you and I have a bit of a disagreement about how much the watch was worth. Okay, and we're gonna have four different permutations of this case. Cases where one claims it was worth less, cases where one claims it was worth more. Okay, if it's worth more, then I have to pay you back. If it's worth less, you have to pay me. So let's see. I believe there's four cases. So you, I lent you money with with a with a, on a watch, and the watch gets lost. Amarlo, I say to you, I loaned you a sella, and you paid me back, um, and you gave me a watch that was worth only a shekel, which is half a sella. So you still owe me a shekel. The halal and you say, what are you talking about? You let me a sell. I agree with you about that. But my watch was worth a sell. I don't owe you anything because you lost my watch. You got my watch. The fact that you lost is your problem. Okay, patur. You're believed. Okay, first of all, I'm a alav haraya. And also it's like, remember, we learned modebi mixat, you have to take an oath. But if you deny the whole thing and say, I paid the back the money already, or like this is saying, I pay back the money, we believe you. Okay, because you would never lie in front of me. Okay, this that whole claim though is going to be a problem when we go the reverse way. So you'd have to say also it's Hamosim Chaver or Alaf Araya. The burden of proof is on me if I want to get money out of you. Sela Huviticha Alaf Shekel Yashave. But if I say it was a Sela and as I bar, I lent you a Sela and the Mashkon the watch was only worth half that amount, so you still owe me a Shekel. Vehala Omer Loki Ela Sela Huvitani Alaf Shlosha Dinarim Yashave. Three Dinarim. Okay, a Sela is worth four Dinarim. So I say the watch was worth two dinarim. A shekel is two dinarim. And you say it was worth three, which means you still owe me one dinar, but you don't owe me the other dinar. That's called mode of a mitzah. You, you agree to half my claim, or it could be part, it doesn't matter if it's half or not. Hayav, then you would have to take an oath to exempt yourself. So yeah, now we flip the cases. You say, you lent me a sela, and... I gave you a watch that was worth double the amount, two slain. And I said, which means basically now that you claim, now that Michelle, you lost my watch, you owe me a whole sella back. And I say, Hello, I said, what do you mean? The watch was worth the exact same amount as the loan. I don't owe you anything. Patur, because I'm claiming I don't owe you anything. I'm going you have to prove. But if you say, I lent you a sella and it was worth two slain, you know, the, the mashkon, I'm sorry, you say you let me two slaim, and uh, you let me one sela, and the collateral, the watch was worth two, and you owe me a whole sela. This is the exact same claim you made before. Vahala Omer, and I say, Loki ela sela vitani alav chamisha dinarim ayashave. It was only worth five dinarim, meaning I owe you one dinar, not the other three that you're claiming, because you claim four dinarim I owe you, and I say I only owe you one. So, chaya, then I have to take the oath. Okay, then I have to swear. Moda be mixado. So we have a moda be mixado of the low bet. We have a low moda be mixado of the malve, and then we have cases where no one has to do anything. So now here comes the the more complicated part. So now they say minish. It's not so complicated, but it's an added thing on this. Minishba. Who takes the oath? Misha pikadonet slo. The malve takes the oath. Why? Because the object is in the hands of, or was in the hands, and perhaps still is in the hands. We don't know. I just claim I lost the watch, but who knows where the watch is? The, this is similar to the previous, right? Shema yishavaze. What's the problem? Maybe if we make you take an oath, what will happen? Maybe you'll take an oath about what the value of it was to be able to exempt yourself from the rest. And you'll see how lots of picadon. And maybe then, then I'll pull out. I'll say, oh, I just found the picadon. And then what happens? Well, there's big debate what the problem is. But let's go with one interpretation that the problem is you just took an oath for no reason because I really had it. So therefore, since I'm claiming it was lost, I have to take the oath. So now they say, in which case, Ahaya, which case do I have to take an oath? First of all, Elaine, if this line is explaining why I have to take an oath in the last case, Elaine Masefa, that's not true. That's not why I have to take the oath. Why do I have to take the oath in the, in the last case when I claimed, right, yes, the mashkum was worth more than the loan, but it was worth not as much as you think. That's because I was moda b'mitzad. That's a classic moda b'mitzad shir, shvua. Of course, tape of lady, shvua gabe malvehi, Obviously, that last case, I have to take the oath in any case, forgetting about whether the picadon is by me or not. It's because I was Moda Bemitsa. So El Amr Shmuel Shmuel explained our ratio. Talking about the first case. Now, in the case of, right, which case? A safe duration. The second, right, the second case, because the first case in the ratio, you don't have to take an oath at all. 
Which case is it talking about? Sela hilvitich alav, shek ala yashaveh, v'ala omer lo ki ela sela vitani alav shosha dinere ma yashaveh chayav. That's the case where the love, the borrower, is mode b'mitzah. It says, you know, it's true that the watch wasn't worth the entire value, but it wasn't worth what you think it was worth, right? It was worth, it was worth three dinarim, not four, right? And therefore, I'm sorry, it was worth three and not two, and therefore I don't owe you two shkalim. Uh, so I don't owe you a shekel. I owe you, right, two, which is two dinarim. I owe you only one dinar, okay? Now, that's the case. The shvua gabe lovehu. Really, the shvua should be the lovah should take the shvua. But because of this issue, right? Because the lovah is moda b'mitzat. But because of this issue, I'm a rabbanan lishdava malve shema yishavaz ev yotzialat pikadon. So even though the lovah is supposed to take the moda b'mitzat, we switch who takes the shvua here because we're worried that maybe the malve is actually keeping the pikadon in their possession. Okay. How this raises the difficulty on Rav Huna, who says that in our case where the person the shomer pinan comes forward and says. It was lost or stolen. They have to take, but I'm going to pay for it anyway. They have to take an oath that's not in their possession. So we'll get back to this tomorrow and explain what the difficulty is. What we did today, we started off with this whole question. And basically we switch it to being the paraz, the subject. And then it is Bala Olam. And it's just a matter of, was it May Achshav or was it May Regalifne, right? A moment before the theft. Talked about the Nafkamino between the two versions of Rav. Then we went to this important statement of Rabbi Yochanan that it's not even paying that gives you the rights to the capital. It's just saying you're going to pay. And from there, we got off on a whole thing. Rabbi Papa, two different versions of Rabbi Papa. Is it true for a Shoel also? Or is it not true for a Shoel? Does Shoel actually have to pay? We saw also a machlog between Rabbi Papa and Rabbi Zvid, according to the second version. We brought a bride to the, raised the difficulty on the Rabbi Papa in the second version. Then we got to this whole thing about switching your, um, switching your opinions. By the way, there's a Gethet, which is hopefully going to come out later today or tomorrow. Um, on this topic specifically about when you voluntarily offer information in the court, right? And then you change, how do we view this? And a whole interesting machloka we've shown them about that whole case about changing your, your claim and different ways of understanding this in a much more in-depth way and getting to a conceptual concept behind it. So definitely worth listening to when it goes up. Um, and then we had all that slew of questions about the heirs, about the this, about the that, which we had no answers to. And then we got to this last halacha of Rapuna, which I just reviewed. So I'm not going to review that again. And then the bride to the contradicts, which we didn't yet understand how it contradicts. With that, we'll finish for today. Wishing everyone a great day. And hopefully, we'll see you soon.